while there is only one perfect Quran, which has been preserved to the letter, to the sound, to the dot, to the word. I am holding 37 different Arabic Qurans in my possession. And early Muslims from 2nd century of Hijra, from uh, 700s to 800s, they were choosing, oh, how many Quran should be there? Remember, Muhammad received Quran in seven different ways. Muslims don't even know what is that seven means. Muslims don't even know what is that ahruf means. But around 300, 300 years after the death of Muhammad, individuals decide which Quran should we pick, which Quran should we follow. As they make their decisions, I want to remind you all, Muhammad was long and long dead while they were making their decision. Let's hear from Professor Yasin Dutton. He explains how those Qurans, different Arabic Qurans were chosen. Please listen the word carefully. The word convenient. Convenient with the big gaps. Let's listen him together. There's at least seven standard readings, seven readings of Ibn Mujahid. Now, Ibn Mujahid, you've got there the sort of rough time period he was in. So that's the beginning of the fourth, the fourth century of the Hijra. So he died 324. So we can assume that most of his, um, if you like, active scholarly life would have been in the early, uh, early 300s. And he wrote this book, As Seba'a Fil Qira'at. Now, as seba means seven people he's talking about. So when he says seven, the seven people, fil qira'at, with regards to reading. So if we translate fi as with regard to. So seven people with regard to readings. He chose seven readings. So there are seven readings that Ibn Mujahid chose. And you can see that they are actually from one, two, three, four, five places in the Muslim world. So there's Medina. Mecca, Basra, Damascus, and Kufa. So when people talk about the seven readings, these are the seven people that they're talking about. And they put, or Ibn Mujahid put Nafi' first, who's the reading, the reader of Medina, same time incidentally as Imam Malik, died 197. That seems wrong to me actually. No, Warsh died 197. Nafi' died one, I think 169. So that's wrong, that's an error. And from, uh, from Nafi'a, there are two main riwayas, two main rawis, Nafi'a, uh, uh, Warsh and Qalun. Now Warsh is the reading that's used in North Africa in particular and West Africa, so Nigeria, traditionally anyways, things are changing quite rapidly. But traditionally, uh, West Africa, Senegal, Nigeria, etc., Mauritania, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, not Libya, uh, those areas would have recited using the reading of Imam Warsh. And alongside Warsh, you could say Warsh's brother, is Qalun. Now both of these, of course, learnt from Imam Nafi directly. Qalun is alive and well, or was alive and well in Libya in particular, and parts of Tunisia obviously uh, neighbours to Libya, and also in Mauritania, because in Mauritania they would learn Warsh and Qalun first, and then go on to other things. So they'd learn them both, because they're both from Nafi'a, and just in order to, to uh, respect Imam Nafi'a, they would do that. Now there's other people who recited from Imam Nafi'a as well, but they haven't come down as strong riwayas. Ismail, for example, from Nafir. So there's, there's others. You'll go to the books about Imam Nafir and you'll find that many people studied under him, many people learnt the Quran from him and transmitted the Quran onto others from him. So that's just, two is just a convenient systematization. In fact, the whole thing becomes convenient systematizations. Islamic knowledge, Islamic history, Islamic sciences, they get systematized for convenience and for accessibility and for simpleness of use. So this is a simplification. We're talking about seven. There's, we'll see there's options of many more than seven. 
So Nafia is alive and well in the reading of Warsh and Qarun, which are both used nowadays. Ibn Kathir, um, I don't think you'll find Ibn Kathir. You'll be lucky if you hear it. You, the specialists know these things, of course. Uh, Abu Amr, yes. A duri from Abu Amr, you get that in, traditionally in the Sudan, Somalia, East Africa, that area. A duri was and to a certain extent still is well used. Ibn Amr is the Damascus reading. Asim, Hamza, and Al Kisa'i, all three from Kufa. And from Asim, there's Hafs and Shu'bah. Now, Hafs is the standard one that most people are familiar with nowadays. So when you talk about which readings you use, people say, don't know. Uh, well, probably Hafs from Asim, because that's the standard one that's printed nowadays. But Hafs, again, isn't the only one, just like Warsh isn't the only one from Asim. And there's a, the other man is Shu'bah. He's also known as Abu Bakr, because he's Abu Bakr Shu'bah. Um, so you'll find that there are these two main readings from Asim, and Hafs is by far the dominant one nowadays. Hamza and Kisei. Hamza is actually quite well known. On the internet, you can go onto various websites and check out Qira'at, and they will talk about the Qira'at of Hamza. So that is, it's still, you could say, it's alive and well amongst the specialist Qura. All of these are alive amongst the specialist Qura, but Hamza is actually quite, is used fairly, as I say, fairly frequently. Go on the internet, you'll find it. Um, Ibn Mujahid, as we said, was living, let's call him the year 300, about that time. Now that is already a big gap. So that's 300 years after the Hijra. So a lot of things have been happening. So this is, as I said, this is a systematization. This is a sort of neatening up of things, a convenient limiting of possibilities. Seven readings is just one possibility. If we extend that out, we find that there are 10 well-known readings. You can find books, um, Al-Qiraat, Al-Ashr, there's a famous book by uh, Ibn al-Jazari on the 10 readings. And when they say the 10 readings, they mean the seven that we've just spoken of, plus these other three. Abu Ja'far is one of the readers of Medina. So we've talked about Nafir, and we've said that he died around 169, as opposed to whatever that other figure was, I'm sure that's wrong. Um, so he's about 30 years, 30 or 35 years earlier. So he's from an earlier generation. If we take 30 years as being a standard generation, so Abu Ja'far is the reader of Medina of the time before Imam Nafir. Abu Ja'far was the Qari of Medina in his time. He was by far the biggest one. There's others, there's four or five big names. Uh, Abu Ja'far was the main one. But it's not the same as Nafi. So they're both from Medina, but it's not the same. So you might say, well, what is the reading of Medina, etc.? Well, it's, that's, in a sense, part of the picture. Um, just to go through quickly, Yaqub al-Hadrami, he was the imam in the mosque in Basra, the big mosque, Jami al-Akbar or whatever they termed it. And so his reading is one of the three making up the ten, but assuming that he read using his reading, that was the standard reading in Basra at the time when he was the imam of the mosque. One just assumes that that makes sense. So I'll just put that in because the three get sort of almost neglected, anything beyond the seven, uh, overlooked, I won't say neglected, but just overlooked, not, not thought about. Um, but this man was the imam in, in Basra, and Basra, as we've seen, is one of the key centers of Islamic learning, basically. So we've got Kufa and Basra in Iraq, and then we've got Damascus, and we've got Mecca and Medina in the Hejaz. So we talk about Hejazi, we're talking about Medina and Mecca, and if we're talking about Iraqi, we're talking about Basra and Kufa. And Damascus is by itself. But some people don't just talk about 10 readings. Uh, you'll find books of the 14. And so there's four others. And again, we've got their geographical locations here. Mecca, two from Basra, Kufa. 
So you can add them up and you'll find that there's, we started off with three in Kufa and add another one in these extra three and add another one. So there's five from Kufa. And then we've got our first Basra and Abu Amr, we've got Ya'qub al Hadrami, so that makes two. These two, Hassan al Basri, Yahya al Yazidi, another two, so that's four. So there's four from Basra, five from Kufa, four from Basra. That's Iraq, right? Iraq was the center of all this learning at this period. One other from Mecca, Ibn Buhaysin, alongside Ibn Kathir, we had in the seven. And we've got Abu Ja'far, Imam Abu Ja'far, alongside Nafir to represent Medina. So there's two from Medina. Um, two from Mecca, one from Damascus, don't ask me why, that's an interesting one, uh, so that's five, and then the others from Iraq. So those are the readings that most people talk about nowadays, that's what you'll find in the books. Either seven readings, Ibn Mujahid being the famous book, the ten, there's uh, uh, An-Nashr, Fil-Qira'at al-Ashr, so Kitab al-Nashr, that's Ibn al-Jazari. But we have these four who make up the 14, so you'll find some books of 14. They generally consider these shadh. Shadh is another <coughs> technical term that we need to be familiar with. It means irregular, non-normative, in some sort of way, a little bit slightly less usual than the other ones. So you have the usual ones and then the slightly yet less usual ones. But in their day, they would have been used as well and they would have been normal. As we've said, like, for example, Yaqub al-Hadrami, his reading was obviously totally normal. Basra, one of the big centers, and if you went into the mosque, it would probably be uh, his recitation. And Aamash said, because he's from Ankufa, he said, there was a time with us where the reading of... Now, I should go to my text because I'm going to forget this. He's comparing the reading, what he calls the reading of Zaid, and the reading of Ibn Mas'ud. And he says, there was a time with us where the reading of Zayd now, the reading of Zayd with us, is like Ibn Mas'ud was with you, or something like that. In other words, Ibn Mas'ud was the standard reading in Kufa in his early years. And then it got overtaken by the reading of Zayd. So that's something about the readings in terms of the people, in terms of the places, and possibly you could also say in terms of their dates. So the second century, uh, died in the second century, and therefore were active in the second century, maybe from the beginning, maybe from the middle, maybe from the end, and a few into the third century. So we heard nice teaching from Professor Yasin Dutton. Did you give attention? Did you give attention to the names, places, and dates? If you gave a little bit attention to the name, places, and the dates, I'm sure you already picked up. Muhammad never gave okay to those Qurans. There were lots of lots of Arabic Qurans were circulating around. Man called Ibn Mujahid, who never met Muhammad, who Allah never gave him revelation. Angel, Angel Gabriel never came and squeezed him, but he find authority to pick seven, seven different Qurans. And then time went on, another individual comes and then picks 10 different Qurans. And then time goes on, another individual comes and picks 14 different Arabic Qurans. But none of them are being seen. Actually, those Qurans are being picked up among many. And none of those Qurans are being seen or stamped by the Prophet of Islam or God of Islam or Angel of Islam. Why those Qurans are being picked up? Because it was convenient. It was convenient. Systemified for convenience and for accessibility with a big time gap. Why Muslims are following the Qur'ans they are following today? It has nothing to do with Allah and Muhammad or Gabriel, but they are doing this because it is just it was just convenient to someone who had nothing to do with Muhammad.